The highly anticipated Manifest Season 4 rocks. After the passengers of the long-lost Flight 828 returned, they were separated by the registry office. Michaela is drawn to the docks by a calling. Following the signs, she enters a shipping container, and suddenly, a hand marked with the 828 symbol grabs her, without hesitating. Michaela rescues the man. Meanwhile, in Eureka, the top U.S. research facility, Sandy is watching the research footage over and over, the captain of Flight 828 appears out of thin air but vanishes again just as quickly along with the wreckage of the plane. Sandy feels they've missed something in their research. Michaela brings the man back to the base. After digging through records, Vance identifies him as Henry, a man supposedly executed by the Singaporean government. Official reports claimed Henry was dead, but he had secretly been sent to China, in his dazed state. Henry asks about the whereabouts of a boy. At the same time, Ben feels a cold breeze sweep through the attic, scattering his papers everywhere, though Cal doesn't sense it at all. Suddenly, a photo of a woman named Anna begins to flutter in the wind. As soon as Ben touches her, the wind stops. Could Anna be sending a message? Perhaps she can lead him to Eden, his young daughter who was taken away by Grace long ago. Cal believes they should immediately search for Anna, but Ben strongly opposes. After all, Cal aged five years in an instant upon returning, and stepping outside could lead to him being captured by the NSA and treated like a lab rat, determined to make up for his past mistakes. Cal finds Anna. After introducing himself, Anna reveals that she's had a calling too she saw a windmill and a gravestone. Cal pulls up a picture on his phone, and Anna confirms it's exactly what she saw. Michaela found Ben, and reminds him they have only a year and a half left before their death date. In this time, they must uncover the truth. But ever since Ben lost his wife, he's no longer focused on the truth his only goal is finding Eden. Even though the police have given him death certificates for both Eden and Grace, Ben firmly believes Eden is still alive. Zeke arrives at the base and grasps Henry's hand, instantly overwhelmed by a strange sensation. Hurriedly, Zeke rushes out of the base. The suffocating pain he feels is indescribable. Meanwhile, Henry keeps muttering about giving the box to the boy. As soon as he finishes speaking, Henry's physical stats skyrocket, prompting Vance to search for the box immediately. At this moment, Ben experiences another calling. To his surprise, he sees a spinning windmill on the death certificate and rushes to the location. Anna, also following a calling, arrives there as well. As Ben approaches the windmill, a cold wind blows again. Ben suddenly notices that the weather vane is pointing in a different direction, guiding him toward his daughter. Sure enough, he hears the cries of his daughter, but when he picks up the child, it's not her. Just as Ben is disoriented, Anna snaps him out of it. Ben gently sets the child down and quickly rescues a man who is drowning in the water nearby. Watching the touching reunion between the child and father, Ben tears up. Meanwhile, Michaela suspects the boy Henry keeps mentioning is actually Cal. So she brings him to the shipping container. With Vance's help, Cal avoids being spotted by the police and reaches the warehouse where Henry was held. There, they find the legendary box. Everyone suspects it's the black box from Flight 828. At that moment, Henry calls for the boy again, and the group rushes to his side. Cal takes Henry's hand. You are the boy. Confirming Michaela's suspicion, however, something strange happens the black box, supposedly from the plane, contains sounds from the Eureka lab. A dejected Ben returns home, overcome with an inexplicable sadness. He puts the death certificate in the fireplace and burns it to ashes while dust billows from Anna's home. Even more shocking, Anna walks into a room to find a little girl painting with grace. Despite the cozy picture, Anna senses that something terrible is approaching. Meanwhile, Cal shows Sanvi his arm, where a scar seems to be linked to the black box. As the sound from the black box plays, the pain in Cal's scar intensifies, confirming they must uncover what really happened on the plane. Ben and Michaela return to the investigation base, searching for clues about Grace's whereabouts. As soon as they enter, Michaela feels a calling, and a bolt of lightning strikes the co-pilot of Flight 828. Ben also senses a calling. A distraught Ben returns home and sees a flower pattern appear on the ceiling. At that same moment, Eden is drawing the same flower, showing a calling resonance between her and her father, but Grace begins training Eden to resonate with her instead. Though each attempt fails, 
Ben chalked Eden's drawing on the shed roof. Eden lets out a happy giggle at the paper in her hand. Curious. Grace brought it over to look at it and instantly became furious. She sternly tells Eden that her father doesn't exist. Michaela brings the co-pilot to listen to the black box recording. He admits that when the plane malfunctioned, he could have stopped it, but didn't, and regrets his decision. Strangely, the black box captured the fact that a passenger had already experienced a calling at the time of the incident. The co-pilot recalls seeing a beam of light during the lightning strike that brought him an overwhelming sense of calm. He wishes the captain were still alive. As he likely shared the same experience, Sandy reveals the research footage, showing the captain is not dead, leaving the co-pilot in shock. Cal says he too saw that light but it appeared in front of the plane, since he was seated in the cabin. How could he have seen it unless the light followed them? Cal asks the co-pilot to help him return to Flight 828, but with the wreckage gone, it seems impossible. The co-pilot likens it to a poem about flying along. Chaotic burning path. Suddenly, Cal is called back to Flight 828. He senses his mother is in danger and insists on returning home, but the captain tries to convince him he belongs on the plane. A woman suggests Cal is powerful enough to return home on his own. Cal finally understands what happened after he touched the wing and disappeared he realizes the captain fears he's forgotten something important. On the other side, Adrian again persuades Grace to let the baby go, but Grace still has the same old story. Frustrated, Adrian visits Egan in prison, sharing his concerns and hopes of advice. Egan. However, tells him to keep a close watch on Grace and Eden. Just then, Egan receives an important phone call. Later, Ben visits the prison, where Egan reveals he knows Eden's whereabouts. In exchange, Ben must help him escape. Ben initially turns to leave, but Egan shouts that he's felt a calling and knows Eden has a gift for drawing. Unlike other girls who draw rainbows and flowers, Eden prefers to draw spiders. Ben becomes agitated but realizes this may be his chance to reunite with Eden, so he reluctantly agrees to break Egan out. Ben turns to Vance, hoping he can leverage his position to free Eden. Vance hesitates, recalling how Egan once broke into his house and traumatized his 15-year-old son. Despite his reservations, Vance agrees to help. Together, they obtain a temporary release order for Egan. Egan scribbles an address on a corner of the document, tears it off, and hands it to Ben. Henry explains that his survival is due to the dragon tattoo on his arm. When he was a child, he was struck by lightning, and his father told him the scar looked like a dragon and would make him strong. Only when his heart rate slowed did he start to resonate with the black box. He describes hearing a buzzing sound from the depths of the ocean. Sandy opens the black box, and inside, overlapping noises play. Both Vance and Sanvi are bewildered by what they hear. Elsewhere, Officer Kyle informs Michaela that the NYPD has assembled a team to forcibly take Henry. Michaela is unsure of their motives, but her priority is to relocate Henry immediately. If they capture him, he'll become a research subject in a lab. At that moment, Henry and the others are still analyzing the sounds from the black box. Suddenly, the earthquake testing instruments begin to react. Sandy quickly pulls the plug not wanting another accident like last time. Michaela bursts in and immediately takes Henry on the run. Vance guides them through the streets via his computer, helping them avoid the police. However, unbeknownst to them, Henry has been implanted with a tracker. Suddenly, a garbage truck blocks their path, but Henry calmly opens the door, steps out, and tells Michaela to leave quickly, just as Henry raises his hands in surrender and slowly walks into the police. The call sends him back onto flight 828. Meanwhile, Cal rushes to the group's secret base, saying Henry seemed to be trying to give him something, but his hands were empty. At the same time, Grace cuts Eden's hair short, hoping to keep her hidden, and quickly leaves with her. They arrive at a motel, where Grace begs the owner to keep their location secret. As everyone now believes the passengers of Flight 828 aren't human and harbors hostility toward them. However, the motel owner locks their door instead, panicking. Grace pulls back the curtains, only to realize the windows have been sealed shut. Zeke finds Ben and suggests using the radio to help locate his daughter, but instead of helping, the people on the other end mock Ben, cruelly joking that his daughter was eaten by sharks. Zeke comforts a devastated Ben, leading Ben to confide in him about Anna. Zeke immediately senses something suspicious about Anna, so the two head to her house. Zeke quickly detects Anna's nervousness, and she admits she has been under Grace's control. However, Grace has already left with the child. 
Ben cried bitterly as he cradled what Eden had left behind, and Zeke was in agony for a moment. Meanwhile, as Eden paints inside, she sees dust swirling in the air, she immediately pulls out her drawing paper, at the same time, Adrian is called to a remote location, when Grace hears a noise and opens the curtains, she sees Adrian outside, prying open the windows to rescue them, Adrian confronts Grace, telling her it's wrong to kidnap a child, but Grace stubbornly insists Eden is her guardian angel, reluctantly, Adrian takes them to his apartment for safety, elsewhere, Cal sneaks into the 828 investigation base, with Dree's help, he manages to meet Henry during his checkup. Henry tells Cal that his mission is complete and that it's now Cal's turn to take over, he adds that Cal, like him, has a dragon inside his heart. Just when things seem to calm down, Cal notices the same scar forming on his arm as Henry's. Meanwhile, Sandy continues tweaking the sounds from the black box, and suddenly, they hear a chilling noise. A big bird that flashes lightning flies from the sky, and Michaela, terrified, returns home and begins to look up information about the lightning bird. Michaela shares her calling with Zeke and calls Dree for help. At that moment, Michaela's computer screen starts scrolling on its own, eventually stopping at a symbol for Shinnecock Nation Land. Following the clue, Michaela finds Tila, and she once again sees the Thunderbird. Tila leads Michaela to a house, where a man opens the door, and the two feel an instant connection, but what ties them together? The man suddenly remembers something and pulls out a painting left by his mother, However, his mother is gravely ill and under government custody, making it impossible for him to see her. Michaela finally understands why the summoning brought the two together for the purpose of reuniting Kyle with his mom. As Michaela drives away, a thick fog suddenly appears, and she is called once again. Ooh, I am... I don't know, stop. I did it, driver. <laughs> She immediately returns to Kyle's house to inform him of the situation. The two infiltrate the 828th Authority with the help of Zeke. Kyle burst into tears the moment he saw his mom. Zeke held the elderly woman's hand, sensing her love and gratitude for her son. All the woman wanted now was to go home. Kyle was amazed by Zeke's abilities. Zeke explained that ever since his resurrection, he had gained the power to read minds. Meanwhile, Cal and his sister were at home searching for clues when suddenly all the evidence on the table began to glow. Cal sensed that this light was the same as what he had seen on the plane. At that moment, Ben arrived at an apartment following the address Egan had given him. Just as he approached the building, he was knocked out with a blow to the head. In another room, Eden was alone when she noticed a glowing fly. She followed it into a pitch black place. When Ben regained consciousness, the first thing he saw was Eden standing not far away. His eyes welled up with tears as he called out to his daughter. At that moment, Grace appeared and, without saying a word, grabbed Eden and took her away. Back at home, Michaela also saw a glowing fly. She followed it to the attic, where it landed on a photo of Bernice. Michaela immediately called Dree, asking her to track down Bernice. Michaela and her group soon arrived at the apartment, where an internal conflict was already brewing. Some people had learned that Grace had kidnapped the little girl, though they were all passengers from Flight 828. Each person harbored different feelings. Even Grace's own mother was disgusted with her, going so far as to kick her out of the house at one point. At that moment, ashes from burnt paper began to float through Eden's room once again. Simultaneously, at the lab where Cal was undergoing brainwave tests, he felt a powerful call. Realizing his dad and Eden were in danger, he rushed out. It turned out Bernice had planted a bomb for Grace, believing everyone wanted to take Eden away from her. This enraged Grace. She intended to blow up everyone there. At this moment, Cal and Vance's team also arrived at the scene. Cal managed to enter the apartment, since Grace had known Cal when he was a child. She let her guard down around him. Michaela seized the opportunity to rescue Ben, and then they dispersed the other 828 passengers. As soon as Ben saw Eden sleeping soundly, he quickly carried her out, but Eden kept crying for her mom, and Grace immediately noticed the sound. In a panic, she pressed the bomb's detonator. Cal quickly pushed Grace aside. Ben dashed out of the apartment with Eden, but as he tried to go back in, the building exploded. Fortunately, Cal emerged unharmed. Suddenly, Bernice burst out with a shotgun. Zeke, sensing Michaela was in danger, became extremely enraged. 
he quickly retaliated, and Bernus was killed by Zeke's bullet. Zeke's actions terrified everyone. Ben's family was finally reunited. But just then, Cal suddenly started coughing up blood. Adrian was also there, saving the injured Grace. A group of people was conducting human experiments at a mental institution, but those who underwent the experiments were left in a horrific state. What had they been through? Since Zeke had killed someone, he had been consumed by an unusual anger, even becoming violent with patients during his counseling sessions. Meanwhile, Eden, who had been brought home, felt no connection to Ben as her father. She resisted him, constantly wanting to find her mother, Grace, helpless. Ben turned to Anna to comfort his daughter, but that night, Eden suddenly saw a volcanic eruption inside her crystal ball, and at the same time, Anna heard a knock at her door. The moment she opened it, something terrible happened. Zeke, who had lost his job, stumbled home drunk, clutching a bottle. Suddenly, he tripped over something. Looking down, he saw Cal unconscious on the ground. The next day, Zeke learned of Cal's condition and took him to see a doctor. To Zeke's shock, young Cal had developed cancer. Zeke brought Cal back home but didn't mention the diagnosis. Meanwhile, the police received news that Anna had been killed. Two 828 passengers had been murdered in less than 24 hours. Both had the same mark on their bodies, and the methods were identical. Could someone be deliberately targeting the 828 passengers to bond with his daughter? Ben built a tiny house for Eden to paint on, but unexpectedly, he discovered a clue in Eden's drawings. Investigations revealed it was a mental institution. So Ben and Sanvi immediately went there. They found several 828 passengers who were in a vegetative state. Just then, the facility manager walked in. Sanvi, without hesitation, told him she was also a Flight 828 passenger. The manager claimed to be the only one who cared about these people. No one else was concerned about their fate or knew what had happened to them. That's when Ben noticed someone named Thomas seemed to have gained consciousness, which meant his brain was still active. Sandy rushed to the archives to search for more information, and suddenly all the files started to glow. Could it be that these nine people were directly connected to a divine consciousness? If so, they might be able to use these eight individuals to stop the final death date. This was the most exciting news they had heard so far. When Ben got home, he received a heartwarming surprise. Eden finally called him daddy. Tears of joy streamed down Ben's face. It seemed like everything was finally heading in the right direction. However, as Michaela was studying the death symbols, she was summoned once again. Suddenly, she realized who the killer was. Just then, Jared knocked on her door informing her that another 828 passenger had been killed. And the prime suspect, according to the police, was Cal. Cal was devastated upon hearing this. Soon, the police stormed in and arrested Cal. Meanwhile, Egan, freshly out of jail, was also summoned. He heard Adrian's cries for help and rushed to Adrian's place, where he encountered Zeke and Michaela investigating the case. Michaela had also been summoned to the same location, but Adrian had already been tied up in a dimly lit basement. Grace never expected that her own mother would do this, and even more shocking, her mother drugged her unconscious. On the other side, Sandy made a significant discovery during her investigation. Summoning was found to be a sapphire anode lead on Thomas's brainwave profile. An onlooker at the experiment mentioned that she, too, knew about the sapphire, as it had been used for summoning during a previous experiment. Each repeated summoning increased its power, causing more pain for Thomas. But what was the purpose of this? To find out more, Sandy decided to have Egan, who was a photographer, undergo a brainwave test. This way, they could view his memories to uncover what had happened. As the current increased, Egan was in severe pain, so Sandy stopped the procedure. Although Egan didn't feel any summoning, he recognized the documents on the table. He knew this place all too well. Egan then told Sandy about Adrian's situation, but when the police arrived at the basement, Grace had vanished. Meanwhile, Grace's mother was forcing water down Adrian's throat. But fortunately, the police arrived in time to save him. She was arrested, and she confessed her belief that the 828 passengers would bring disaster to the world. So she planned to kill them all before the catastrophe struck. While waiting for his son at the 828 detention center, Ben suddenly heard a familiar tune. He rushed to his friend's house and played the same song on the piano. Suddenly, the numbers on the sheet music glowed. When combined, they formed a phone number. Ben dialed it immediately. The person on the other end was none other than Cal's doctor. It seemed there was no longer any way to hide Cal's condition. Just as the authority was about to draw Cal's blood, Ben arrived just in time with the doctor. Ben embraced Cal tightly. 
He couldn't bear to lose another family member, but fate rarely goes as planned. A police officer barged into the house under the pretense of a search. Zeke immediately recognized him as Grace's father, and the two men started fighting the moment they met. Zeke took a bullet to the leg, and the officer's true motive was to take Eden. <laughs> Before long, more police arrived. A shaken Violet texted her boyfriend, telling him what had happened. To her surprise, her boyfriend TJ showed up. He had been summoned to find the sapphire and invited she to join him. But to everyone's shock, Egan had already gotten his hands on the sapphire. Ready or not, Omega Sapphire. Here I come. A woman then plunged her arm into the lava, and it instantly transformed into a powerful Kirin arm. It all began the day before when Cal's cancer had reached an incurable stage, and he was told he might not survive beyond the next day. His devastated family prepared a large dinner to comfort Cal, hoping to make him feel better, but before anyone could enjoy the meal, they were all summoned back onto Flight 828. The terrified group felt that this summon was an ominous warning it seemed to be telling them that their time was almost up. On the plane, Cal saw the indicator lights flashing, and a suitcase fell from seat F7. That seat belonged to Thomas. Zeke and Jared rush off to find Thomas, and the three Michaela sisters arrive at the loft ready to grab a few bottles of champagne to keep the fear at bay only to find the compass spinning. Michaela felt the compass was trying to lead them to someone. Sanvi and Michaela followed the compass's direction and eventually found themselves in an old warehouse. As soon as they entered, a wall across from them was suddenly broken down. Egan and Leo had also followed the summons to this location. At this moment, the compass pointed to a heart painted on the wall. When Egan dug into the wall, he was shocked to find the bricks were shaped like tarot cards. Egan plowed through the wall and found several more small bricks with letters carved into them. Michaela suddenly realized that the tarot deck was the same as the one at home, and she immediately called Violet. Following the pattern of the tarot cards, they placed the letters onto the corresponding cards, as if they were on a treasure hunt. Meanwhile, Thomas was brought to Ben's house. Strangely, Thomas, who had previously been unresponsive, suddenly extended a trembling hand. As if he wanted to draw something, Cal handed him a blue crayon, but Thomas didn't take it was the color wrong? Sure enough, Cal handed him a red crayon instead, to everyone's shock. Although Thomas was scribbling chaotically, he managed to draw the image of a volcanic eruption. At this moment, Michaela and the others had matched all the letters to the tarot cards, but one card was missing the volcano card. However, Thomas's drawing of a volcano clearly couldn't substitute for the tarot card. It was then that Michaela noticed a triangular metal grate at the base of the wall, shaped like a volcano. Cleverly, Michaela used a lighter to ignite it, and in an instant, the entire wall burst into flames. As the outer layer of the wall peeled away, a carving of a dying goddess was revealed on the inner wall. Everyone present was stunned, and Sandy immediately took out her phone to take a picture, but Eden noticed a hole in the statue where they finally found the long-lost sapphire. Suddenly, the warehouse began to tremble. Egan ran out quickly, shutting the door behind him. Riley's leg was trapped under a heavy stone, but with their help, he managed to avoid losing it. Just then, Moss burst through the door. It turned out he had also been summoned to the location, and the two lovers finally reunited. Michaela called Ben to inform him, and everyone at home overheard the news of the missing sapphire through the speakerphone. As Ben was putting Eden to bed, he failed to notice that Eden had been on a phone call with someone the entire time. Before leaving, Eden gave a crystal ball to Thomas, but when Jared tried to return it to the authorities, the crystal ball suddenly exploded. Everyone was once again summoned to Flight 828, watching as volcanic lava slowly crept toward them. In a critical moment, Egan appeared, looking confused and holding the sapphire. Michaela frantically urged Egan to hand over the sapphire. This gemstone was the key to saving all the passengers of Flight 828. But just as suddenly, Egan and the sapphire both disappeared. With the plane getting closer to the volcano, everyone panicked. The reason for Egan's disappearance soon became clear someone had struck him and stolen the sapphire. The next morning, strange things began happening at home. Ben saw his long-deceased wife and, with tears streaming down his face, told her how hard life had been without her, but his wife told him to take Eden to the cemetery. After saying this, she vanished. However, 
When Ben took his daughter to the cemetery, his wife instructed him to give their daughter back to Grace. Just as Ben was feeling confused, he noticed something odd his wife's eyes were supposed to be blue, but the person standing before him had black eyes. It was clear this wasn't really his wife. At that moment, Grace appeared, holding Ben at gunpoint and demanding that he return Eden to her. Ben had no choice but to let Eden make her own decision, and Eden chose Ben without hesitation, enraged. Grace clutched the sapphire tightly, roaring like a wild beast. At the same time, all the passengers of Flight 828 experienced unbearable headaches. Meanwhile, Violet and TJ were comparing photos of the goddess statue on the wall. When they connected the dots on the photo, they realized it formed the constellation Draco. Following their summons, Ben and Michaela arrived at a church, where half the floor was already covered in lava. Grace was kneeling before the goddess statue, praying like a possessed person, claiming that she was an angel. Michaela aimed a gun at Grace, telling her that it was all over, but Grace responded by calling Michaela blind, saying she dared to try to kill an angel. At the same time, Cal's arm scar began to glow, and he was suddenly summoned back to the plane. Grace, holding the sapphire, was also summoned there, and Cal tried to persuade her. Just then, Cal's mother appeared again, urging her terminally ill son to let go, but Cal immediately realized this wasn't his mother, as she had never once told him to give up. It turned out the sapphire could summon people's innermost hopes. Cal slowly approached Grace, attempting to seize the sapphire. In an instant, the sapphire shattered. Cal collapsed unconscious, and at the same moment, the goddess statue in the church exploded, burying Grace beneath the rubble. Meanwhile, the police raided the lab, and Sandy quickly erased all the experimental data. Zeke stared at his hand, suddenly realizing something. He rushed to Cal's side, placing his hand on Cal's arm. In that moment, all of Cal's symptoms transferred to Zeke. Zeke called Michaela to say goodbye, finally understanding that his second chance at life was meant to help him make up for the regrets of his past. From the day he met Michaela to their marriage, all the wonderful moments were deeply etched into Zeke's memory. Now, it was time to say goodbye. Michaela, hearing this, ran home in a frenzy. Meanwhile, Grace spotted a fragment of the sapphire. Just as she was about to reach for it, she fell into the lava. Without hesitation, Grace plunged her hand into the lava, screaming in agony from the burning pain. At first glance, it seemed that the sapphire fragment had embedded itself in her hand. By the time Michaela and Ben arrived home, Zeke had already collapsed on the floor. But miraculously, Cal had woken up. Could this be the legendary life for a life? However, no one could have anticipated that Grace would emerge limping from the church. And in an instant, lava began to erupt throughout the entire city. The cries of struggling people pierced the silence of the night. Since the return of Flight 828, the authorities had been detaining the returnees, fearing they had become mutated beings upon their return. Bethany, one of the detainees, was suddenly summoned, frantically demanding to be released to save Georgia. Amidst the chaos, Ben and Michaela seized the opportunity to escape, but every door was locked. Luckily Vance passes by to set the two free. Bethany, sedated and rambling incoherently, seemed to be under some kind of summons, and Sandy believed she should be released immediately, but she still has to wait for Bethany to wake up and ask questions. When Ben and Michaela finally made it home, Cal's arm scar glowed again. In an instant, Cal was summoned to Flight 828. He saw an apple roll onto George's seat, and heard her repeatedly calling for Bethany to save her. Carefully observing outside the plane, Cal noticed a vast field and a small red car with many guns in the back seat. Ben and Michaela rushed to George's house and learned from her that the red car belonged to a man named Anson, who was also a frequent passenger on Flight 828. Georgia had planned to meet him at the warehouse. The three of them immediately headed to the warehouse, but as soon as they stepped inside, they came under fire, fortunately. Michaela took down the attacker from behind. At that moment, the authorities located the escaped Ben. They arrived at Cal's house, using his phone to track Ben's location. Upon receiving the message, Ben smashed his phone. Knowing their cover had been blown, Georgia finally revealed the truth. Out of the 191 returnees, nine had been living in a safe house all along. Georgia had been providing them with food and medicine, while Anson, using his status as a returnee, had contacted Georgia to find other passengers and claim the bounty. The authorities had issued a warrant, offering $50,000 for the capture of any returnee, dead or alive. So far, returning 828 passengers are the path to riches for all. 
Ben decided to send Georgia back to the safe house while he and Michaela voluntarily returned to the detention center. They thought this would protect the Flight 828 passengers, but to their surprise, that night, the warden and his men entered the lab and stabbed the captain. The next morning, Ben began acting strangely, scribbling on the walls nonstop. The warden quickly called Sanvi, and after Ben had filled the entire wall with writing, he finally stopped. Even Ben was bewildered by the markings. After studying the writings, Sanvi and Ben discovered that it was a map of the detention center. So the two rushed to follow the map's guidance and could finally find Stab the captain in a secret room. Sanvi rushes to his aid and at this moment Cal is once again summoned to the 828 airplane only to see an apple appear on the ground. When he picked it up, it was covered in blood. To his shock, the long-missing Angelina appeared on the plane. Ever since her arm had been burned, she had been summoned intermittently, seemingly connected to Cal in some way. They always seemed to find each other, though Cal wanted to keep his distance from her. Looking at the blood stains on his hand, Cal realized that the scene he had just witnessed was real. <laughs> Suddenly, a swarm of locusts flew out of his mouth, and these locusts had gone extinct many years ago. Could they have been brought back on Flight 828? Two guards were stung and covered in welts dying before they could even be taken to the infirmary. The presence of the locusts haunts the research base, and Ben feels the call once again. As a ship pulls up to berth 57 at the end of the Manxon dock, suddenly, a long-haired woman appeared in the water, and Ben clearly saw a winged necklace around her neck. Michaela suspects it has something to do with the lifeboat, and the chief listens and immediately takes Ben to the lab. Michaela and Jared headed to the pier to search for clues and discovered that the boatman was Egan's father. The police rushed to find Egan, and it turns out that the necklace was left to him by his mother and functions as a reminder to the soul to maintain good behavior, but Egan had long since pawned it. After returning from Flight 828, Egan never saw his parents again. He only received a text from his father saying he wasn't welcome home, and that whatever happened to them was none of his concern. This has always been a source of pain for Egan. Ben suspects Egan's mother might be in danger, so he sends Michaela to check on her. Sure enough, they find bloodstains on the floor. Just as the three of them begin to panic, Egan's mom shows up. She admits to taking all the money, but refuses to say how she spent it. That's when Ben is summoned, and it turns out that he comes right up to a seaweed-covered steel box. Egan reveals that a woman is involved, and that he was her inside man in a series of nefarious deeds. Jared immediately moves to arrest her, and Egan's parents come to the detention center to see him. Although Egan is selfish and difficult, his parents have always loved him, seeing his father's long-lost smile. Egan finally lets go of his past resentment. Meanwhile, Cal is called to a large pit, where he finds the woman who had been sitting in seat 28B. Gravely injured, he brings her home. This woman once gave Cal a warning to leave the plane. To figure out what's going on, Cal uses his dragon scar to summon himself onto the plane, only to discover an olive tree growing in seat 28B. While Cal and his sister step out, Angelina is up to no good. She uses the sapphire to project herself as Cal's sister tricking Eden into placing a photo of the olive tree under the pilot's seat in 28B. She also convinces Eden to open the Bible, where they read that God will send two witnesses symbolized by olive trees to bring about the apocalypse. The judgment will only come after the two witnesses die. Angelina believes she's the executor of this prophecy and must kill the two witnesses to trigger the end of the world. The people who took Angelina in were shocked to hear this, but Angelina insists she's the angel of the new world. At that moment, 28B starts struggling to breathe. If she's taken to a hospital, she'll surely end up in the detention center. Cal's sister instructs him to use his dragon scar to project 28B to Sanvi. Following Sanvi's guidance, Cal performs a needle thoracentesis to relieve pressure on her lung. 28B is saved, but another body arrives at the detention center. Sandy discovers that both victims share DNA with the pilot. That night, she sneaks into the isolation room and, after gaining the pilot's consent, draws his blood. Meanwhile, Angelina projects herself as Cal's sister again and manipulates Egan into pulling the tube from 28 BS lung. Angelina successfully kills one witness and is determined to continue her mission. Just a few hours ago, Cal and his eldest daughter discovered that 28B had stopped breathing. Through surveillance footage, they found that Eden had pulled the tube, but she appeared to be talking to the air. Cal immediately thought of Angelina, if he could project through the dragon scar. Then Angelina, who had the sapphire, could do the same. So, Cal made a dangerous decision and used the connection between the dragon scar and the sapphire to find Angelina. 
He angrily accused her of using Eden to kill, but Angelina tried to drag him down to her level. Soon, strange things started happening. Michaela saw Zeke, who had long been dead. In the middle of their heartfelt confession, Zeke suddenly became a stranger to her. At the same time, Sandi noticed the captain's blood starting to flow in reverse, which was visibly reflected in the test tube. Sandi begged the captain's son for help. Just then, all the water in the cafeteria turned to blood. The people at the shelter were terrified and in disarray. Ben rushed to find Sandi, and tests revealed that all the blood in the equipment had the captain's DNA. Sandi wanted to modify the serum using the captain's son to sever the connection with the captain and stop the catastrophe. But just as the blood was drawn, the captain went berserk, trying to break out of the quarantine room. It turned out that Angelina, disguised as the son, had provoked the captain. It turned out that Angelina, disguised as the son, had provoked the captain, saying everything was his fault. In the end, the captain was shot and killed, and Jared arrested Angelina based on the address Cal provided. When the people in the shelter saw her, they immediately felt a sense of dread. At the same time, the captain's son was in deep pain over his father's death, but his blood flowed down the drain into a nearby river, turning its clear waters red. The co-pilot, who had fled, turned himself in at the shelter because he wanted to see the captain one last time, but the captain was already dead. After Angelina was imprisoned, everyone wanted to kill her, but the head of security secretly met with her, trying to find the location of the safe house. To escape quickly, Angelina used the sapphire's power to search, but its immense force caused the entire shelter to start shaking. Sensing something was wrong, the co-pilot hurriedly asked Ben to pass a code to the people in the safe house. At that moment, the head of security asked Ben to explain the situation with the river to the public. Ben took the opportunity to send out the code, which enraged the crowd. Soon, the head of security found the safe house through the address Angelina had provided, but it was already empty. Furious, he dragged Angelina to the lab, intending to extract the sapphire from her hand. But when Sandi performed an ultrasound, she discovered that the sapphire had fused with Angelina's body. Forcing it out would kill her. Ben overheard this from outside and was determined to make this menace disappear. Ignoring Sandi's objections, he injected her with a shot. Not only did Angelina survive, but she caused earthquakes around the world. Egan crawled out of the rubble and rescued Angelina. The two fled to the relocated safe house, where those injected with the same serum developed rashes. Worse still, everyone's callings vanished. Ben believed he had ruined everything. Angelina's scream restored their callings. At that moment, TJ walked in holding a sheet of paper. On it was a drawing of the World Tarot card. Sandy immediately pulled up the water test report and found that red algae were rapidly growing. The cause of the river turning red was the algae, not the captain's blood. Only hydrothermal vents in the Earth's crust could trigger such algae growth. Suddenly, the director barged in and arrested Sanvi. TJ thought of the volcano and the crystal ball. It seemed to be a warning that humanity's demise would be self-inflicted. Sure enough, the shelter was struck by another earthquake, and many people fell into the magma. The director ordered the immediate lockdown of the shelter, just as everyone was preparing for the worst. The doors opened, and everyone ran outside. But before they could get through, they were all dragged back inside. This included Ben's two daughters, who had come to visit him. At that moment, Angelina confessed to everyone in the shelter that she was an angel sent by God and would lead them into a new world. Cal, the only one able to hear the call, took a risk and returned to the plane, trying to help the others connect to the call. But instead, he absorbed all their calls. The noise was so overwhelming that Cal nearly broke down and had to stop the call. But if he could summon it to each one individually, he might be able to help them receive it. So, Cal returned to the plane and randomly chose a seat. As soon as he sat down, vines wrapped around his neck. Cal began to suffocate. Jared quickly woke Cal up. Through the vines, Jared and Michaela discovered an abandoned house and immediately sent the address to Cal. Angelina kept proclaiming she was an angel, and in two days, the world would end. With only eight people surviving, Cal quickly left her and headed to the location. As soon as the two arrived, they heard cries for help. It turned out a pregnant landlord had been kidnapped by a thief. Just then, gunshots rang out outside. It was Ben on the roof, calling for help. The landlord revealed that she had been digging through the wall for a long time, trying to save those trapped in the shelter. Because the house shared a wall with the shelter, with Jared's help, 
they quickly broke through the wall. Ben's family was finally reunited, and the child the landlord was carrying was Jared's. Jared had developed feelings for Michaela, but now he realized he had a child outside. Michaela silently left. Watching the couple in love, Cal arrived at Thomas's bedside, only to be grabbed by the arm. The dragon tattoo awakened instantly, and they saw a peacock merging the blue sapphires on its wings. Cal suddenly remembered what Angelina said, only by working together could they open the door to the new world. Cal drew what he saw and began calling again. Countless images flashed before his eyes, and the chaotic noise filled his ears. Cal forced himself to stay calm and immediately called a meeting with everyone. He needed to match the images to each person. Cal was carrying too much. The burden of Flight 828 weighed heavily on him. Amid the noise, a sequence of numbers appeared. Ben analyzed the numbers and found they were the zip code for New York, but that code had been decommissioned, and the address was now a dilapidated building. Meanwhile, Sandy was locked in a lab, tasked with finding a way to prevent a volcanic eruption. She and a fellow researcher found a chance to disable the security system. The moment they opened the door, they encountered Ben and his group. Sandy was safely returned to the shelter. At the same time, Egan knelt down and professed his love to Angelina. With everyone watching, the two embraced, but Cal kept calling himself. Yet this time he felt nothing. The disappearance of Cal's call was a massive blow to everyone. With only one day left until the end of the world, what were they to do? Some had already said their goodbyes to their families. Cal hid in his room, crying, and Henry came in, handing him a carved Chinese dragon, hoping to inspire Cal to keep fighting. Meanwhile, Egan and Angelina officially got married, as they basked in their happiness. There was a knock on the door. Adrian urged Egan that they couldn't wait any longer. At the same time, Thomas, lying in bed, suddenly awakened. Sanvi, watching through the monitor, saw Thomas speaking Hungarian repeatedly, but no one could understand him. Ben asked him to draw what he meant, and the result was a coffin. Would they all really die? Why were the passengers of Flight 828 chosen to decide the fate of the world? Elsewhere, Angelina told Adrian that she was a great angel sent from above. Adrian didn't believe her and mocked her. Just then, Angelina was suddenly called to the plane by Cal to stop the end of the world. Cal decided to cooperate with Angelina, and they both extended their arms. But when Angelina realized he was trying to save the world, she immediately stopped the sapphire fusion. Cal was heartbroken by the betrayal. Meanwhile, Angelina began selecting the people who would survive. Adrian vehemently opposed her right to choose, but Angelina said that God would guide her to Noah's Ark. Upon hearing this, Egan immediately chose to leave with Adrian. He had originally proposed to Angelina to get the sapphire, but now, all he wanted was to save humanity and be with his family. Angelina cursed Egan, saying he would die a terrible death tomorrow. Meanwhile, Thomas kept talking to a photograph. Ben quickly realized he was talking about Noah's Ark, Sandy suddenly remembered that she had once thrown a piece of wood embedded with a sapphire into the crack beneath Mount Storm King, but that piece of arc wood had been excavated from Mount Ararat when the plane returned. There was no time to waste, and Cal and the others rushed to the foot of the mountain. They stared in horror at the cracks in the ground, but despite their efforts, nothing worked. Realizing they could do no more, they resigned themselves to waiting for the end. They sat around a campfire, imagining what the apocalypse would be like. As everyone slept, Cal quietly got up and went to the crack, determined to do his part to save the world. Just then, Ben rushed over to stop him, but Cal had made up his mind he loved his father, his family, and the world. Cal extended his arm into the crack, and the passengers of Flight 828 all saw a blue light. They followed the light to the crack, and when they boarded Flight 828, they had no idea how much suffering and life-changing events awaited them. Suddenly, the ground began to shake, and magma gushed out. Just as everyone panicked, the 828 plane emerged from the ground. Was the plane here to take them home? Ben believed it was their only way out. And one by one, everyone boarded the plane. Just then, Angelina appeared. She ordered her people to board the plane. But suddenly, the ground began to tremble again. Angelina changed her mind and told her people to get off the plane. But the sapphire's power had disappeared. As her followers prepared to board, Angelina flew into a rage. She would not allow anyone to betray her. In the chaos, Sandy was accidentally shot in the arm. Ben picked up the gun and pointed it at Angelina. His wife's death had devastated him, and he wanted revenge. But just then, an explosion knocked Angelina aside. And Ben, choosing to let go of his hatred, carried her onto the plane. 
All the passengers of Flight 828 survived the apocalypse, but shortly after takeoff, they began having difficulty breathing. Soon, some of them started disintegrating like a volcanic eruption, reduced to ashes. Adrian was the next to experience the same fate, but Egan quickly pleaded with the heavens, saying Adrian had never done anything wrong and was a good man, offering himself in Adrian's place. Immediately, the cracks transferred to Egan. Adrian also began praying to the heavens, and so did Sanvi. She had never committed any sins, so why was she being punished? But Angelina was different, no matter how much she prayed, it was useless. <laughs> Suddenly, Black smoke appeared in the cabin, and Angelina transformed into a demonic angel, seemingly ready to judge everyone on the plane. Michaela and Ben shouted in fury, condemning the demon's disregard for life. And with their cries, the demon vanished. At the same time, the volcanic eruption stopped, and everyone rejoiced they had survived the end of the world. But the co-pilot noticed a blue light in the chaotic sky, and he accelerated towards it. A blinding white light stunned everyone. Michaela opened the cabin door and stepped outside, only to find their families waiting for them. Everyone had returned to the day they were supposed to land, and even Cal had reverted to his childhood self. But had they really disappeared? The wounds on their arms, the objects they brought back, all were real. Only Angelina didn't return. It's only after facing life and death that people truly learn to cherish those around them. Is this ending one that everyone can accept? 